Okay, we'll keep track now on the use cases of generative AI for text. Um, we're going to dive into my news desk, who are using tools, generative tools, to press releases, other content, and to optimize it for other media platforms. So please welcome already here on stage, Ola Gustafsson, senior data scientist, and Daniel Jonsson, chief analyst and strategy, strategic officer, please. Right, great, we're up and running. Uh, I'm really happy to have attended many uh, interesting presentations so far. And it's quite exciting to get to share some of our insights around uh, on the topic, basically, of uh, generative AI. So today we will uh, talk a bit about our, uh, like our learnings and challenges as well from developing and launching products based on generative AI. But before we get there, uh, we will start by building a bit of context around uh, kind of what we do at my news desk, like a short introduction. Uh, and kind of we'll talk a bit about why AI is key to our product uh, and also why it's key to our company as a whole. After that, we'll get into more about like the journey and the learnings uh, of like building with large language models, basically. And we will end with questions from the audience. Yes. So let's get right to it. So what is my news desk? So my news desk is actually a PR tool that started 20 years ago. Uh, and it started with a simple idea. It was started by a journalist, actually, who, who, who had an idea of, like, he was a bit annoyed. He got his inbox uh, bombarded with different press releases that wasn't very relevant to him. Uh, and he, like, he got the idea that what if a journalist could actually opt in to the press releases that they were actually interested in, like the topics that they're interested in. Um, and that's how it all got started. Uh, and what came out of this was a tool for journalists and also for communicators, uh, like the people at organizations uh, that want to communicate. Um, it's, it was a tool for them to be more efficient at their jobs, basically. And throughout the years, like you can see on the slide, uh, like this product has kind of evolved with the media landscape. So we, we built out new things. Uh, but the original mission of unleashing human creativity uh, in PR and communication, that remains to this day as well. And AI and NLP has long been part of what we do. Uh, but the time now has come to kind of take the automation to the next level. And of course, this is where like, large language models comes in a lot. Um, so not to complicate things too much, uh, my news is at least three things. So we are, um, like primarily we are this tool for communicators to actually create awareness around their brand uh, or organization. Uh, and the primary goal for these is often to, like you want to get media coverage, you want, to, you want the media to write about you, basically. And we're a software as a service company, so these are actually our customers. And it's also the ones that we will focus on today. But just to mention uh, as well, we are a place where like any stakeholder, like the general public, uh, can go and read news from organizations. And we're also a tool for journalists, as I mentioned, to find, find relevant news. Um, so to dive a bit deeper into kind of the communicator use case, uh, we are a tool to help them throughout their whole workflow. That's really our vision. From the moment that they start to build their PR strategy to uh, content creation, uh, like, and before that, ideation as well. And like you go through distribution, analytics, and follow-up. And throughout the years, we have built out functionality uh, using AI as well to support the whole, like most parts, I guess, at least, uh, of this workflow. And we used like approaches like text embeddings, uh, topic modeling, name and recognition. And it got us quite far. We managed to um, like build this feature where we recommend journalists because we match up the editorial interest of journalists, what they write about, with what our customers write about. And we also do near real-time scanning, like we scan the web in near real-time to detect any time a press release is picked up, uh, and we notify the, the customers. Um, but today, like our most important initiative is to take steps into the earliest part of this process. So this is namely the ideation, creating your PS strategy, and also creating content. And of course, this is where we see a natural uh, 
spot as well, natural place for large language models. Uh, and one of the most obvious use cases for us is to figure out, like, can we actually help our customers to write good press releases? Uh, and that's what we're going to look at an example for uh, right now. So let's say we want to write a press release about this event. Uh, and as a user, I would, like, I would actually uh, like write the main message that I want to convey. Also, I will write the target group that I want to target. And pretty soon, I will have something to start from as a customer, as a communicator. Uh, so I have, like, instead of starting from a completely blank paper, I have a draft, a first draft. And I think, like, I think the output is OK as well. It doesn't seem to hallucinate too much. Um, but I'm not, I might not be completely happy with this, of course. Uh, so I can also get some like, suggestions from the uh, AI as well. So let's say I want to deep dive in a theme that the AI suggests. So maybe I want to highlight yeah, maybe the date and time and the venue of the event. Um, and we can actually regenerate. If we go back, then we make sure that the, the AI will actually adjust the text accordingly. Uh, and then you can do this a few iterations. And of course, the next step is you want to take this to manual editing. Um, and that's kind of the workflow that we, like one example that we have been working on. Um, and so at Menuses, we have a really diverse set of customers. So it ranges from like big corporations to uh, public sector organizations to NGOs, down to like 10. 10 people businesses, basically. Uh, and we know like in many of these target groups, uh, it's like a challenge to create the compelling content. It, often it boils down to like having the time, sometimes the competency as well, because sometimes you're not even a communicator. You might be like the CEO running, running things. Um, so like actually helping to write for our customers, for these communicators, is actually a really important problem for us to solve. Uh, but we also have some questions like who will actually use this? Like, of course, if we launch something like this, who will be the users? Who will be the early adopters? Because, like, after all, we're also dealing with a uh, proud profession of, of uh, communicators who may be really passionate about writing as well. But let's come back to this question again uh, like, who is the early adopters? Uh, and before we go back to that, we will uh, get into a bit of the journey from Ola here. Yeah, okay. Uh... Well, as a data scientist, my job involves staying updated on, on new technology, especially in natural language processing and search, because our work primarily involves text data. So uh, initially, I was quite um, skeptical about the generative AI and its potential for our business, um, especially considering that we do business mostly in the Nordic languages. Uh, so, consequently, I, um, I didn't prioritize experimenting with GPT-3, even, even though we did have uh, API access for over a year. But in the fall of 2022, last fall, I started working with the DaVinci 02 model. That's the first one on the timeline right here. And by November, which is quite fast, I would say, by any stretch of, um, by any measure, uh, we had actually developed a service that was capable of generating press releases, social media posts, blog posts, and um, do it all in Swedish, which was kind of amazing at the time. Um, while the quality wasn't really that good, it wasn't exceptional in any way, it was actually usable. Um, <laughs> and then in, um, uh, just shortly after, in November, came the new model, the text DaVinci 03. So we had to chuck everything we had done up until that point, we had to chuck it out the window. All of the prompts were unusable. Um, and we had to go back to square one. So, um, um, yeah, we had to postpone the launch. And then shortly after 03 came ChatGPT, which you all know which it was a world success. And um, it became the new benchmark for quality. It changed all of our standards. Um, so um, when finally the 3.5 version came out, um, we could actually tell the marketing department that our text was were just as good as ChatGPT, because that, that was kind of the standard. Uh, and the 3.5 Turbo is the one that we have behind our current service. Uh, we, do, we do experiments with GPT-4, but it's, uh, so far it's too slow and too expensive to, do, to make into a product so far. 
So, um, well, my job is um, my job title is a data scientist. So I that used to mean someone who collected collects data, cleans it, and builds models to make predictions. And I was hired partly because I had built some fairly decent models of Swedish Swedish language models in the past. But about two years ago, Daniel and I made the hardest decision we could ever make, which was to not build models. Um, we work with text in many languages, and we could either, either hire 10 data scientists to start building what we needed, and we could multiply the effort for every language, and then we could wait a few years and, to get it done, and then we could start build products and services on the results, or we could go out and buy what we needed. So at that point, we chose to buy. And within six months, we've built, we've built, we've built a platform, a search platform with metadata, like topics, entities, and taxonomies. Uh, we could also do semantic search on that platform, which, uh, honestly, I'm just beginning to understand what semantic search is, is capable of doing for us. Uh, and now, on the other side of ChatGPT and OpenAI, we're glad that we did so, and that the process kind of prepared us for something it prepared us for building product features focusing on customer value and the process that a customer has instead of on data science. But uh, it's, a, it's, a fact, it's a fact of life that big foundation models, that's something that we have to leave to the big companies now. It's just a fact to accept. So, um, the large language models, models are enablers. Uh, we're a small company, we have several markets, several languages, and uh, as Daniel said, an extreme diversity of customers. So everyone has to work with communication in some shape or form, and media coverage is valuable to most. Um, and the LLMs now are trained on so much data with so many languages that they work well for all of our languages and markets. So where there used to be one model to solve a problem for each language, there is now one model for all languages. That's the complete game changer for us. Um, and, as David so well pointed out, uh, the LLMs are general problem solvers. Well, there used to be one model for entity recognition and one for entity linking and topic classification. There's now one model to do it all. So this means that even, that we're a small organization, like 100, 100 people or so, um, but this means that we can actually launch product features and help customers in a lot more countries and launch features at once within weeks, I would say. It's an amazing thing. And uh, lastly, among the takeaways, like models are not all that matters. So um, as we started building products, we suffered different <laughs> the model updates from OpenAI because it wasn't our deal. Uh, just as we were about to push the button, a new model came out and the previous efforts were obsolete. So, what also happens is that everybody's standard changes, and the frame of reference was switched out for each model. But now we're at GPT-4, and um, other things come into play. Models are now quite, they are good enough to do a lot of tasks quickly. And um, one thing that we saw uh, Daniel demo here was the interaction patterns. So building a product on a large language model, you have to think about how the model interacts with the users. And that makes a world of difference for the quality. So, as, uh, as we could see on the demo, the model actually asks us questions, clarification questions, to make the text even better. Um, and to make the text work for any use case, basically. Um, so, the interaction patterns is one. The process, um, just as we saw David talking about uh, different steps in the journalistic process, um, the communicators have a corresponding one as well. And if we know that well, and if we break it down to the actual steps of the process, um, there's a world of quality to be had from LLMs. And also, we, we care a lot about the, um, um, we talk a lot about the hallucinations of, of language models, uh, and that they sometimes invent facts. But um, what if we just um, add the facts as we use it? What if we connect the LLMs to, for instance, our media monitoring? like all of the news that comes out, or the internet, just, just by pasting a URL and having the LLM access that URL. Um, it can access the facts, and you can reference them, and things can get f factual. Um, yeah. 
And also, uh, we talk, we've heard a lot of talk about the system prompts. Now, we call that context. Um, but basically, you tell the LLM to act as a, um, a journalist or a, a PR consultant, and we sort of charge him with a lot of knowledge about a company or a customer, uh, and we create a persona that can act. So if we do that carefully, uh, that persona, you can, ask it, you can ask him to do anything. Um, and you can have more personas, uh, one that represents your target group. How would the target group respond to this text? And you can ask all of them that and get a decent answer back. Um, yeah. So the battlefield of competition is now open to a lot more companies, and the battle is won by being good at perhaps other things than just building models. OK. Uh, so I have a question mark on this one, our success story. Um, we're still in the, in the very early stages of our journey. We have a lot to build, and we have a lot of challenges to overcome. And um, eventually, we did launch the uh, templates, the AI templates, we call them, for a select group of users. And one user decided to test it by writing about a new product. It was a fairly, um, fairly mundane product, I would say. Something about roofing, I believe. <laughs> yeah. Indeed. And, but it worked well. So within a couple of days, that customer actually had media coverage from multiple outlets. So evidently, even though we were hesitant to believe it, uh, the product had reached the good enough threshold for someone to use it. So we did send flowers to that customer. Um, since then, hundreds of customers have created press releases using our tool. And the users disproved our initial doubts. So that's, I believe, what their success lies. We're, we're a small company. We have fast feedback on, on what actually goes on. Um, our success is also that we've realized we can provide a lot more value in a lot more ways than we thought previously possible. So generative AI allows us to exploit the entire communications process, the problems and solutions of our users. So our success story is that we are providing value with AI today. We have a direction. We listen to the customers. We iterate. And we feel encouraged to do a lot better. This is a fun journey for us. Great. Yes. Uh, and as Ola mentioned, we did manage to put this type of tools actually in the hands of thousands of communicators, if you look at like the top of the funnel. So right here, we have a, a funnel of uh, adoption, you could say. So like from the initial interest, starting to use the feature, through like creating, drafting content, uh, up until like actually publishing something using this. So just to come back to the question at the start of the presentation, so who were the ones that actually are using this tool? So who are, are the ones that are taking the steps to actually automate part of their workflow as the, in their profession? So it turns out it's actually the small organizations. So like the small and the medium organizations are the ones that are actually ending up publishing, taking this the whole way. Um, and we can see, like we also uh, see in tests that uh, it can take them five minutes to, to like be almost ready to publish, like doing the last uh, steps towards publishing, whereas that could take like an hour or more before. So it is really a time saver. Uh, so just to conclude, uh, kind of the uh, like uh, yeah, the conclusions for that we want to, to kind of uh, end with. Uh, in our experience, as I said, the, the early adopters are not like the most tech-savvy, uh, PR mature, as we call them, audience. It's rather it's the smaller organizations that want to get the job done. And it's also, it, this could actually give a voice to these smaller organizations that ha have less resources. And after all, like these companies, maybe they wouldn't have the opportunity to actually communicate anything, uh, because like the time saving is what enables them in this case. And we can also say that product in UX is more important than ever. Uh, so bec just because large language models are actually performing uh, best in class in so many tasks, it, in a way, it has kind of leveled the NLP playing field. You know, like you don't need a 200 people NLP re research team to be a player. Uh, but you can actually, like, if you understand your users well, you're good at building products, you combine that with unique data, you're really on a good path, I would say. And lastly, I think like in this new paradigm of product development, speed is really important. So actually like learning fast is really a differentiator as well. Uh, so I think that kind of sums up our learnings from the presentations. So also I guess go to questions if we have time.